were saying, Japan has a peace constitution, too. Yep. Japan renounced war in Article 9 of its constitution, aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order. The Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as a means of settling international disputes. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The whole ideological split between East and West, in the end, it's just a greedy scramble for wealth by the ruling classes. The Western bourgeois stand to lose everything if their countries go communist. After all, the communists want to abolish private property altogether. So the capitalist rulers desperately tried to halt the global spread of communism. Hence the phenomenon of red baiting. One of my more popular videos on Japanese politics I've made recently was a video I uploaded in January talking about why like, American conservative types love Japan and talking about how Japan actually does have a pretty strong left-wing movement in that it has one of the biggest communist parties in the world in a country that isn't ruled by a communist party. And in that video, we spoke about Kojima and other people who I really admire the work of. Now, I've made actually multiple videos on Metal Gear Solid as well. And I've mainly spoke about the politics of games like Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. But today I want to take a further look at Kojima and also Miyazaki in, I guess, the context of looking at cultural imperialism on Japan that kind of started with the US occupation following the Second World War and how it has influenced both their politics and both their work. But honestly, in this video, I thought it'd be nice to take a creator who I really, really like, who I know loads about, Kojima, and contrast it with someone who I don't know much about because I haven't really watched any Studio Ghibli films, so I don't know about the politics and his messaging. But recently there was a quote, which I'm gonna talk about going around that he said, that shows how much he hates like Hollywood and also hates American culture. So in this video, I'm going to talk about these two creators and their work in kind of the context as a response to American cultural imperialism on Japan itself and like I said, how it influenced their works. And for Metal Gear Solid, I really wanna focus on the main plot of Metal Gear Solid 5, The Phantom Pain, mainly talking about the language thing. And upon researching this video, I didn't realize how much I actually liked this topic in the game because I played it when I was only 20 years old, I believe, and I haven't actually revisited it properly. I've played it a couple times like from the start, but never got around to finishing it. So it is very interesting. And if you're someone who's maybe my age or younger, or maybe didn't pay much attention to the cassette tape stuff, you might find this video pretty interesting as well. But just a reminder, if you wanna support my channel and support this video, maybe like the video if you like it, and maybe share your thoughts down in the comments. Also follow me on social media, at The Cavernacle, on Twitter, on Instagram. Come join our subreddit down in the description. Also, if you would like support my work on Patreon, I'm trying to build as many one to three dollar patrons as possible. And the benefits of that are getting my private patrons Discord server and getting my Nintendo Switch friend code. Also, I'm live streaming two times a week now. I had a lot of fun talking about Blade Runner last night. That is now archived on my second channel, The Cavernacle Extra, another stream coming tomorrow. So in my past videos covering Japanese politics and specifically covering Metal Gear Solid, I did focus a lot on trying to prove to you guys and the the audience that Kojima is actually left-wing, probably a socialist. He actually recently shared a Japanese socialist novelist's work on Twitter. I think it's pretty clear at this point, but I mainly focused on Peace Walker and how the characters in that game all like love Che Guevara and talking very positively about Che Guevara. I was shocked the first time I saw you. You look so much like him. Huh. I look like El Che, huh? I wonder if Che and his men ever sat around and drank mate. I bet they did. Che was famous for his love of the stuff. Your men see you as a great man. <laughs> as great as the century's most complete human being. That's Sartre, right? Well, there's hardly been a more iconic figure of his times than Che. Oh, he was more than that. He was a true revolutionary and a great warrior. How you fight with the Sandinistas in Nicaragua against the American CIA, and that's all like a very left-wing story, and how does the general message of Metal Gear being against nuclear weapons, and having lots of progressive messaging does prove that Kojima is a socialist. But I wanna start this video by taking two quotes from both creators, starting with Miyazaki, because this was going around social media the other day, despite being like a fairly old 
interview and he's basically talking about American cinema and Miyazaki is a pacifist and he has called out things like the Lord of the Rings which I feel like is a bit bizarre for the tone he's going for but Kotaku reporting on this a few years back. The time Miyazaki went off on America, so a quote from him, I dislike the United States that dropped the bombs and does not regret it. I'm anti-security council. I'm against neutral alliance, against Americanization, and this is the main theme of this video. So obviously I had no interest in riding an automobile. I hate people who are proud that cheap Japanese cars are popular in America. I look at people who wear badges of the US Army and US Air Force that filled Vietnam with dioxins as enemies. So I'm against motorization. So why did such a man come to ride an automobile? When my wife's belly began to grow, the young me believed that as a husband, it was my duty to carry the same weight. So I decided that even though I did not know if it was a boy or a girl, in order to take my child to nursery school, I would go to driving school, a place that still gives me shivers to remember. All driving school should burn to the ground. My wife went through quite an ordeal with a difficult birth but it was equally difficult birth for me. This is from an essay about how Miyazaki learned to drive but the setup written in the present tense seems to show a bit of resentment towards the west. While the clear connection is missing from the text the implication is that Miyazaki hated cars because they were American. There are also a couple of doodles by Miyazaki depicting an angry younger version of himself. One on the upper right shows him spewing anti-western vitriol with lines like anti-jeans, anti-bourbon, anti-burgers, anti-fried chicken, anti-cola, anti-american coffee, what's my car you moron, anti-New York, anti-West Coast, Disneyland, go back to America. So another article in 2019 with some more quotes that have been going around. Miyazaki seems to hate Lord of the Rings, Indiana Jones and Hollywood movies. Americans shoot things and they blow up and the like. So as you'd expect, they make movies like that. If someone is the enemy, it's okay to kill endless numbers of them. Lord of the Rings is like that. If it's the enemy, there's killing without separation between civilians and soldiers. That falls within collateral damage. How many people are being killed in Afghanistan? The Lord of the Rings is a movie that has no problem doing, not separating civilians from enemies, apparently. If you read the original work, you'll understand, but in reality, the ones who are being killed are Asians and Africans. Those who don't know that yet say they love fantasy are idiots. So what he's referring to here is probably something I've made a video on, and it's what the inspiration for the bad guys in Lord of the Rings were. For example, I think the orcs were inspired by the Huns and you can go check out my video about that if you care about learning a bit more about that. So he goes on to say, even in the Indiana Jones movies, there's a white guy who bangs shoots people, right? Japanese people who go along and enjoy that are unbelievably embarrassing. You are the ones that bang get shot. Watching those movies without any self-awareness is unbelievable. There's no pride, no historical perspective. You don't know how you are viewed by a country like America. And I guess he's referring to the second Indiana Jones movie, probably not the first or third one. So obviously it's clear from those Miyazaki quotes, he does not like US cultural imperialism. He does not like Japanese consumers, like I guess eating up American culture while at the same time not realizing, I guess, how maybe American cinema views them. Now just a reminder, Miyazaki was born in 1941. So he has experienced this sort of thing happening over his life and you can maybe argue about how common it is for Japanese people to be seen in this way in American cinema these days but it's obviously something that has been true for a long time. Now Miyazaki is far far more explicit with his political views as we'll get on to later when we talk about him a bit more. Someone who's a bit more subtle in terms of like what he actually says to the press not very subtle in terms of his work at times Kojima gave an article to The Guardian back in 2014 talking about the upcoming Phantom Pain before it was released. And Kojima said, Metal Gear questions the US domination of the world. Kojima seems just as comfortable making scatological jokes as he does commenting on nuclear proliferation in his games, even if the resulting tone is uncomfortable and uneven. With Ground Zeroes, he escalated the stakes by taking aim at North America's contemporary policies. In the past, the US was the center of the world where everything was happening. I think my stories have always sought to question this, maybe criticize it, but the situation is changing. America is not seen as the center of the entire world anymore so the focus on my stories shifting alongside with that change in the real world it's a diplomatic answer but ground zeroes is not especially a diplomatic video game it's incarcerated suspects neo and wire cages bound at the hands and feet with blinding sacks over their heads as you hoist them onto snake's shoulder and sprint to an evac chopper some break down in tears either through fear or relief it's grimly political gitmo was definitely something that i made decisions to address in the game Hollywood continues to present the US Army as being the good guys, always defeating aliens or foreigners. 
I am trying to shift that focus. These movies might not be the only way to view current affairs. I am trying to present an alternative view in these games. So two interesting perspectives from two different generations of Japanese men. Of course, Miyazaki is in his 80s while Kojima is in his late 50s. So an interesting contrast and interesting how one, I suppose, is a little more subtle as someone who was raised as part of the generation who weren't involved in the war, but did experience American cultural imperialism for good and bad. Now we're gonna get onto this a bit more and talk about this article and essay I was reading. But Kojima does love American cinema. Like it's very, very clear in his games that he does have a lot of reverence for American filmmakers and creators and just like Western cinema as a whole, like he's big pals with Del Toro, Nick Reffin and Del Toro are both used as models for characters in Death Stranding, he loves Mads Mikkelsen, he likes Norman Reedus, he likes a lot of his actors, he loves James Bond. But I think it's pretty telling, and I made a whole video essay about his own politics and his upbringing. Like, he grew up in Osaka, and he said him and his family used to watch movies all the time. Now, in Metal Gear Solid 3, you can ring Paramedic, and Paramedic will save the game for you, but her and Snake will discuss mostly American movies from the 1950s and 60s. Snake, you ever heard of Godzilla, King of Monsters? Snake, have you ever seen For a Fistful of Dollars? Snake, do you know the creature from the Black Lagoon? Snake, have you heard of It Came From Outer Space? Snake, have you ever seen The War of the Worlds? Snake, have you seen 007 from Russia with Love? Nah, I don't like those movies. Real spies are nothing like James Bond. It's pure fantasy. Snake, I don't think the Major's going to like you saying that. And even though it's fiction, I can't help but comparing myself to Bond. What exactly don't you like about James Bond? I mean, is it the fantastic gadgets, the cars, the guns? Now, I don't know this for sure, but I'm probably assuming that these movies are actually taken from Kojima's own upbringing, that if his family were always watching these American films that became very popular, he probably did watch a lot of James Bond, Clint Eastwood, and The Creature from the Black Lagoon. So moving on to the article, and maybe you'll see how Kojima's and Miyazaki's worldview formed, American cultural imperialism in 1960s Japan as seen in Haruki Murakami's Norwegian Wood. We're not gonna talk about that, but I do find parts of this essay interesting to talk about the cultural imperialism. So this article is by Bakhti Nugroho. In the 1960s, Japan began to transform into a developed country after losing in World War II. Around 15 years after its defeat, Japan experienced some social and cultural changes which were brought about by the US during their occupation in 1945 to 1952. So this was called Operation Blacklist, led by General Douglas MacArthur, the Supreme Commander for Allied Powers, with support from the British Commonwealth. At this time, the local Japanese culture began to fade away, and as a result, the Japanese culture adopted Western culture brought by the Allied Powers. First Westernization of Japan occurred in the Meiji Restoration. In this period, the help of Western influences, many policies were made in many aspects, including industrialization, militarization, and education in order to modernize Japan. However, since the 1930s, it underwent its pan Asianism ideology. The idea of this ideology was to return Japan to Asia rather than the West. It was applied by abandoning the diplomatic cooperation with the West and prohibiting the symbols of Western culture. In Murakami's Norwegian Wood, which is set in the 1960s, more than a decade after US occupation, Japanese young adults seem to enjoy and celebrate the democratic ways of life and modernization by the colonizer. There are two important findings of homogenized Japanese society which can be seen in this novel, the dissemination and glorification of American pop culture and American lifestyle. In this case, in the 1960s, Japanese young adults began to adopt Western lifestyles, including the concept of dating. Western style dating included other activities such as dancing, watching movies, and drinking coffee, which were popular among young Japanese couples. In fact, during US occupation, according to a Takahashi Tetsu, the occupation forces had to instruct the police that kissing was no longer to be considered an offense against public decency. In fact, dating was also strange for most Japanese because of traditional Japanese marriage. It is a traditional method to find a spouse in Japan before the US occupation, and it's an arranged meeting between two people looking for someone to marry. This system had remained at least until the arrival of American soldiers in post-war Japan. Thus, cultural changes which were imposed by the US during and after the occupation to post-war Japanese society by mass media created an erosion or even a disappearance of traditional fundamental Japanese culture. Meanwhile, in fashion, both 1960s Japan, male and female, no longer adopted traditional clothes. In this case, in post-war Japan, American pop culture, including modern Hollywood style, became a central model for Japanese people, especially for youth or young adults. Since the occupation, the customary clothing that spread and followed by Japanese people, young Japanese women known as Pan Pan girls began 
of the dress and the styles of modern Hollywood. So like many places during the Cold War that are Western aligned, they were greatly influenced by Western and mainly American culture. And it's clear to see how this culture could enter Japan even further because of their new relationship and alliance with the United States, including having the US actually stationed there from 1945 to 1952. In the Metal Gear Solid games, that is actually how Kazuhiro Miller is actually half American and half Japanese. After that, Yokosuka was flooded with American soldiers come to occupy the country. My mother was still in her mid-teens, and she learned from her cousin how to survive in that town by servicing the troops. That's how she met my father and how I was born. Now, cultural imperialism is nothing new. It didn't just happen in Japan in the 1940s and beyond. Of course, it happened throughout the world during the colonial period, whether that was, you know, Vietnam, whether that was parts of China, whether that was India, whether that was Egypt, parts of Africa. The British, of course, also exported their language around the world, which is one of the key themes of Metal Solid 5. And that was a mechanism to do this cultural imperialism. And of course, you have other examples where in Ireland specifically, the English tried to actually erase Irish culture, including Irish language, and nearly succeeded. But I'm happy to say that the Irish language is making a big revival at the moment. But you can see why people like Miyazaki, who were born in 1941, would maybe hate what they see as an attack on Japanese culture, in that through his, I guess, teenage years, he would see Japan slowly shift from the tradition of his childhood into being more westernized and more like America. And you can kind of see through this lens why he would have such a big problem with this stuff and why he would hate American culture so much because he feels like American culture wasn't largely adopted out of like free will. It was actually imposed on the Japanese by the US occupation and then later the US alliance between them and Japan. So it's an interesting take there. But Kojima, like I said, is from the next generation who didn't remember the old Japan and grew up in a Japan except in Western culture. And that can maybe explain why Kojima is so much more pro Western media despite having his own criticism of the US, while Miyazaki is anti-American government and also anti-American culture. So the Japanese language wasn't erased. Of course, English became a very popular language in Japan. I think it's one of its biggest foreign languages that they speak. But Kojima took aim at cultural imperialism in Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, specifically at the English language, which of course is now the linga franca, has been spread around the world through colonialism by, of course, first the English and the British Empire, and then, of course, the American Empire and the American domination around the world. But there's a reason people in Vietnam speak French and English. There's a reason people in India speak English, and it's not because one day they all felt like learning English. So I read another really good academic paper from the University of Kansas by Christopher Hall, Language Danger, Metal Gear Solid 5, and the Weaponization of English. So basically, Skull faced the villain of Metal Gear Solid 5. His plan is to disseminate a, ling a language-activated parasite that will rid the world of every language except English and to arm every conceivable world power of its own nukes, all of which he will retain secret control over. The Phantom Pain mounts procedural claims about speech, especially through the player's interaction with Skullface. In the penultimate mission of the first part of the Phantom Pain, the Hungarian Skullface delivers a harrowing monologue about the role of English in his life. I was born in a small village. I was still a child when we were raided by soldiers, foreign soldiers. Torn from my elders, I was made to speak their language. With each new post, my masters changed, along with the words they made me speak. Words are peculiar. With each change, I changed too. The young Skullface was stripped of his Hungarian mother tongue and forced to speak other languages, including English. The experience filled him with a hatred of English and its growing role as the Linga Franca, and his views and history rhetorically posit the language as a destructive and oppressive force wiping out other languages as it becomes increasingly ubiquitous, a force closely bound up with imperialism. The destructive potential of speech emerges in various forms in other stories like George Orwell's 1984. 1984, of course, is a bit of an influence on The Phantom Pain. It's the year that the game is set in as well. A part of the efforts of Big Brother to repress free speech and the formation of rebellion, the government within the novel has instituted the official language of 
New speak, the rhetoric of this imposition of language by force within the totalitarian state of the novel's story world pairs closely with the Phantom Pain's procedural rhetoric about speech, as Orwell also mounts a cautionary argument about militarized attacks on the spoken word. Like Skullface, characters in 1984 experience the frustration and restriction of being coerced into speaking only within an acceptable norm. By the time the player reaches the mission in question, it's become clear that Skullface is developing a strain to destroy the English language. Skullface tells Venom, Sans lingua franca, the world will be torn inside, and then it shall be free. Having been presented with Skullface experience of oral English, the player is procedurally urged to consider the connection between language and imperial violence. Skullface's childhood in particular, oppressed by foreign invaders seeking to impose their ways of being on him and his fellow citizens, suggests resonance in the oppressed worlds of colonialism. Skullface was displaced from his native culture and language in the chaos of World War II in Hungary. Of course, imperialism and colonialism closely intertwined with political projects have ravaged world communities long before and since the middle of the 20th century. As Andrew Dolby argues in his 2002 book, Language in Danger, Skullface's hated Linga Franca has been guilty of not only being a tool for ideological supplanting and forced assimilation, but of actually annihilating entire languages en masse. While the use of English spreads all around us, we are also seeing the rapid disappearance of hundreds, eventually thousands of minority languages. This is not to contend that the growth of English is in every case the cause for the extinction of other languages, but rather to interrogate this relationship in the context of the Phantom Pain's argument, I therefore mean the concept of language danger or language in danger to refer not only to the weaponization of language within a story world, but also to the real world destruction of indigenous languages and to question whether spoken English presents a trans world danger to other languages. Language of the colonizer as a means of displacing the language of the colonized threatens the world of the colonized in many ways that are not solely linguistic. The methods of communication available to a colonized people, their foundational concepts, their means of education are all grounded in the spoken language. That structures and perpetuates their culture, and this is threatened when there is imposition of an external language bearing its own attendant ideologies. So interestingly in the game, there is also this character called Code Talker who is Navajo, and he actually joins up with Skullface to develop the parasites. And just on a wiki guide on IGN, just giving a bit of background, in his younger years, Code Talker was taken from his mother and brought to an American Indian boarding school and given the name George. Along with many other American Indians, he was taught how to be civilized and how to speak English, being told Navajo was a dirty language. Code Talker remembered that if any teacher heard someone speak a word of Navajo, the teacher would make that person eat an entire bar of soap. As his nickname suggests, he was apparently a code talker for the US Army during World War II. This turned out to be untrue, unlike many other Navajo who did serve that purpose in the war, and instead he helped to make Navajo an even more cryptic language that would later be used by code talkers sent to the Pacific Theater. So obviously that theme of Metal Gear Solid V is super interesting, and basing it on whether it's like a Hungarian character or more importantly, I think a Navajo character, with some Navajo helping the Americans to actually create codes that could not be deciphered by any other country because it was in Navajo, which was only understood mostly by the Navajo tribe. And I'm sure maybe some white Americans might have learned it in the US Armed Forces to help with this project as well. Then at the same time, Code Talker's backstory is one of where the US has tried to completely erase various Native American cultures, and how did they do that across North America, including Canada? They did not let these people speak their own language, and they forced them in many ways to become Christian and trying to become American while never actually seeing them as Americans. And it's obviously something that is super relevant today. But like I said earlier, this happens across the world. It happens with the Navajo here, it happened to the Irish historically at the hands of the English because destroying people's culture, which happened in Ireland to a large part, taking away their language, not only erases a lot of their history and identity, it also erases a lot of your personality. Think of how you try and learn another language and how foreign it is to you and how you cannot often get your own personality across in that foreign language, even if you do know it quite well, because that's what's gonna happen if you can't no longer speak your own language. So let me know down in the comments, if you aren't a native English speaker, how do you feel about the plot of Metal Gear Solid V if you've played it? How do you feel, even if you haven't played it, about what I've discussed? Because it's obviously a very interesting critique, especially now and probably since, I guess, like 100 years ago, the economic world order is dominated by a country that speaks English. And if you want to do 
proper, I guess, business with them or maybe become their ally, you also need to speak English. And if you kind of want to assimilate into this economic world order, you're going to have to have a lot of people who speak this language. How many Indians work for American and British companies? A lot of them do like call center work for them or do tech support. A lot of stuff gets outsourced over there. And India benefits as a country in some ways because they can get this work from Western corporations and in some ways get that investment, although they are often paid awfully. And it is a really interesting discussion about how imperialism can work through erasing language and therefore erasing culture. And that's, I guess, for some people, an argument against this globalized American dominated world is that people will buy into this because they want to consume American entertainment that is so dominant and so popular, and I guess to a degree good. Now, like I said, Kojima is not as anti-Western culturally as Miyazaki is. And of course, while there was a degree of cultural imperialism in Japan, through the American occupation and beyond, it did not erase the Japanese language. It did not erase Japanese culture, although it did change a lot of it. But Miyazaki has a lot more anti-American politics. Now, on Game Rant, surprisingly, I don't put much value into Game Rant. They did two good articles by Alison Stolberg talking about the politics of Miyazaki, which I wanted to share quick because I don't know Miyazaki's work that well compared to Kojima's. So a deep dive into the politics of Miyazaki, he's one of the most famous animators in the world, producing Studio Ghibli, which created critically acclaimed films like My Neighbor, Totoro, Princess Minoke, and Spirited Away. The man does not shy away from teaching anti-war and environmentalist sentiments in his work due to the time he was born. Miyazaki lived deeply rooted in the consequences of war. He was born in 1941, four years before Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In his interview, Miyazaki described that even as a child, he felt the war was stupid. He said, I came to truly hate Japan, thinking I was born in a country that did stupid things. When the war ended, he was very young. Miyazaki did say he remembers the air raid that burned his town. He also remembered feeling humiliated when Japan lost the war. He read a lot of books and studied war stories such as the Machine Gunners. It was at the time he read that book that Miyazaki said he realized if he was born earlier, he would have likely been a patriotic military boy. He described that people did not really know what war was like until they're about to die, and that's why so many volunteered. Father of Miyazaki produced parts of war planes during World War II. Miyazaki described his father as a nihilist and a realist, which influenced how Miyazaki saw the war in Japan. Apparently, right after the war, Miyazaki's father immediately became friends with some Americans and would invite them over to his place. As Miyazaki grew up, he said that he never wanted to sing Japanese songs and he was ashamed of the imperialism of his homeland. However, in his 30s, he re-examined Japan after traveling a little through Europe and found that he loved it, though not in a way a patriot would claim. He loved the environment and the nature of the islands. I thought Japan would be a truly beautiful country if it was without people, he grew to believe the land had tremendous power. Miyazaki has a lot of thoughts about Japan's economic structure as well. We lose feelings of reality when we work for numbers. He disapproves of the market-oriented system, believing that it denies a spirit that makes things truly our own. Miyazaki wishes for a world where people know how to sew, make a fire, and cook their own food, and find peace and meaning in it, rather than what the economy views as unpaid labor. He hates that the economy has a stranglehold on people experiencing real things, as they usually work, and they have to decompress from work each day in a cycle. So like I said, I haven't watched too many Studio Ghibli films but i thought this one was interesting to talk about because it's in response to the iraq war in 2003 miyazaki was invited to accept an oscar for spirited away in the us however he did not come he later told the la times that he did not come because he did not want to visit a country that was destroying iraq this information did not come forward until years later and then another article by the same person why miyazaki thought how's moving castle would be unpopular in the us so this anime came out in 2005 the movie was based on the book of the same name the studio ghibli movies plot revolves around sophie who is cursed by a witch to become an old woman so she seeks out the wizard how to break her curse the movie has a lot of similar themes to other studio ghibli films such as compassion pacifism however it was revealed in a book about the famous director miyazaki's world picture that miyazaki he actually did not expect the movie to be a hit in the US. In fact, he thought it would make American audiences uneasy. Despite his thoughts, the film was a major success in the US. As to why Miyazaki thought the movie would be unpopular, it was actually to do a lot with his politics and the Iraq war. The Iraq war specifically influenced how Miyazaki framed the war in How's Moving Castle. In the movie, the war is fueled by the desires of people in power rather than any form of logical justice. He shows through How's Curse how humanity can be lost 
through all this fighting and that there is a looming point of no return at the heart of man. War is everywhere in Howl's Moving Castle. Despite the plot mostly taking place outside it, soldiers are seen in the background of nearly every city. There are tanks on the streets, warships coming home on fire and tons of warplanes. Everyone is knocking on Howl's doors hoping he can use his magic for the war effort. Witches and wizards that do not dedicate themselves to fighting in the war are seen as enemies and traitors. There are three big reasons that the anime film was still a success in the US. The first reason is that a lot of Americans did not connect the war in Howl's Moving Castle with the war in Iraq. This is because the film does not go deep into the war. It does not cover much of the nations or their reasons for fighting outside the missing prince. Miyazaki's connection to the Iraq war was incredibly subtle. To fans, Howl's Moving Castle could be related to any war. In fact, it is about any war, but at the same time, Miyazaki did reflect on the US and Iraq when making the film. But like I said, unlike Kojima, Miyazaki is perfectly happy to give his take on contemporary Japanese politics. So this is back in 2015. Animator Miyazaki slams Japan's Abe ahead of controversial security votes. As Japanese lawmakers debate a controversial security bill, one of the country's leading artists has criticized Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's desire to reinterpret the constitution as despicable. The controversial bill would allow the Japanese self-defense force personnel to play a greater military role overseas. I presume that PM Abe wants to leave his name in history as a great man who changed the interpretation of the constitution, but I think it's despicable. When asked about Japan's current day military exports, the animated director and former studio Head said the current state was a very unfortunate development. So if you have been in any argument with a lot of conservatives or reactionaries on Twitter, no doubt you will have people who have anime profile pictures. And it does seem that anime in general does attract a lot of reactionary people. Of course, the whole origins of 4chan and 2chan stem from anime fans making these message boards. But at the same time, a lot of people involved in anime who I haven't even spoke about are very, very left-wing, and Miyazaki clearly is left-wing based on his own quotes and based on his work. I did read somewhere that he used to be a communist, but then he distanced himself from communism because he didn't like the USSR, something that he shares with Kojima, who also doesn't seem to like the USSR as well. But the Japanese Communist Party at the moment currently does not like the Chinese Communist Party either, so you could possibly still be a Japanese communist and not like the USSR or like China. But I just think these two creators are very, very interesting for showing you how the Japanese left view American cultural imperialism and view American foreign policy because both share that, that they both do not like American foreign policy. They will both use their mediums to criticize American foreign policy. And that could stem from a lot of reasons from the US foreign policy directly affecting Japan and the militarization of Japan and US military bases in places like Okinawa. But where the difference comes from is that Miyazaki, as someone who's a lot older and did grow up in a more traditional Japan, generally really hates American culture in a lot of ways. While Kojima likes American culture as someone who grew up in American culture in Japan, but he still shares the sentiment of Miyazaki about, I guess, being against nuclear proliferation, being against US foreign policy, and generally I would say, despite the fact the Metal Gear games are very action heavy in a very stylized way, you are encouraged in these games to be more pacifistic. You are encouraged to use like chokeholds or use sleeping dart guns because this pacifism seems a bit stronger on the Japanese left than it does in other left-wing places, especially, I guess, the left in the United States. And seemingly you guys enjoy me talking about it, but I do enjoy talking about Japanese left-wing movements because it's very, very interesting to me, this country that shifted quickly from an ethno-nationalist military dictatorship to a Western-style and Western-built democracy that had so much Western influence in it and what political movements get born out of that. It's just sad that the ruling party in Japan was essentially created by the CIA to promote Western interests and wins nearly every single election. But the only hope that I have in Japan is that I guess the Communist Party is somewhat popular compared to communist parties in most Western countries. But if anyone ever says to you that like Kojima or Miyazaki are some sort of conservative, I will only grant that Miyazaki seems a bit more like a traditionalist and he hates industrialization, but I would never say either of these people are like largely conservative and Kojima certainly isn't. And at large, I would say a lot of Japanese are, especially video games and animes and mangas, they are broadly left wing. And lots of you responded to this tweet I put out 
sending me loads of animes and mangas that were left wing. Sorry I couldn't get to all of those. And I couldn't talk about them all in the video, but please leave in the comments your favorite Japanese created property that does have a left wing message. Because it seems more often than not, the more popular Japanese media that gets consumed in the West always has some sort of left wing message. It's just that conservative gamers and anime fans have really poor analysis skills, so they don't actually realize they are being fed left-wing messages or the whole point of the thing they love is about having this left-wing message. They just like the aesthetics of it, I guess. Anyway, this was a fun video to make. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Follow me on social media at The Cavernacle on Twitter and Instagram. Join our community on my Reddit and check out my Patreon. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.